text is in chapter 12, beginning in verse 22. He said to his disciples, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as, as small a thing as that, why are you so anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow was thrown into the oven... How much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Do not seek what you are to eat, what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In the account we looked into a couple of weeks ago, the Lord was interrupted by a man. Remember that story? The man... Uh, the man wanted Jesus to arbitrate between him and his brother regarding an inheritance. Jesus refused, but then he began teaching on covetousness. The underlying principle protecting us from coveting is actually one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. If that's what life consists of, then we will want to add more any way we can. And that leads to coveting what others have. And to reinforce that principle, Jesus then tells a story about an, a wealthy farmer whose life did consist in the abundance of his possessions. And Jesus concluded that story with this, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now that leads us to the question, how do we lay up treasure in heaven, and how can we be rich toward God? And how do we do that in relation to the things down here? Our anxiety about earthly, everyday things often distracts us from keeping our minds and hearts set on things above. You know what that's like. Problems come up, and who's thinking about heaven and who's thinking about God we're thinking about this stuff in this text Jesus answers the question about being rich toward God and at the same time keeping a rein on our anxiety so I want to summarize the text before we jump into it when I when I read through a text I start thinking about it, I think how can I organize this so that it'll make some sense and so we can get to the point of the passage or do I even understand the point of the passage so earlier in the week, actually last week, I was working on this, and um, I had three points. That's unusual, isn't it, for a sermon? Three points. And, and it was anxiety in life, anxiety in faith, anxiety in the treasure principle. I started working on that a little bit, and then I changed my mind, because that more or less made it into the introduction, but, but that really didn't cover, I didn't think, the passage quite the way it should. Um, I want the body of the sermon to focus on why we don't ha have to be anxious and to be able to figure out what is the remedy for anxiety. We get anxious about food. We get anxious about clothes. That's verses 22 to 27. We get anxious about the work of God and the promises of God because sometimes we're not sure that God really knows our situation or that he cares. That's verses 28 to 30. We get anxious 
that if we don't hang on to our stuff and keep accumulating stuff, that we won't have any stuff and our lives will be empty and eventually over. That's verses 31 to 34. So kind of hang on to that. We'll come back to that. But I want to take you on a brief ride on a personal hobby horse for a minute. Is that okay? <clears throat> you have to say yes. <clears throat> um, I'm going to do it anyway. So um, one, over the past two or three months, uh, I have noticed various preachers and teachers, some that I've read, some that I know, um, some that I've heard, who make the comment sort of like this. It really doesn't matter that much about what we believe. I mean, theology doesn't really matter that much. Um, and then go into a statement of something like this. Being a Christian means loving Jesus. And if we love Jesus, nothing else really matters that much. We don't want to wander into the theological weeds. That's just divisive and that's counterproductive. But my friends, theology is what we believe, and correct theology is what the Bible teaches about God. To have a correct theology, we must know what the Bible teaches about God, and we need to embrace it. Ultimately, what we believe about God affects how we live every day. And I would suggest to you that what we believe about God affects how we respond to the things of life every day. What we believe about God is going to impact whether or not we worry. So back to our text. If our theology about God is wrong, we will never be able to overcome anxiety. I'm serious about that. If our theology is wrong, we will never be able to overcome anxiety. We will never be able to do what Jesus says here. We will not be laying up treasure in heaven. So we're going to look today at what Jesus is saying to us about God. I'm arguing that if we have the right view of God, it will make a difference in the way we respond to life. If we have a right view of God, we can live with less anxiety as we lay up treasure in heaven. In this passage, we're going to find four attributes of God that will make a huge difference in the way we live. Not exactly anxiety free, but a whole lot closer than we usually are. So let's begin with the first one. We're gonna talk about God's providence. When I'm saying God's providence, and that's basically verses 22 to 24, and verses 27 to 28. If you have a Bible in front of you, you can refer to that as we work through this. When I think about God's providence, I'm thinking about God, um, working with his invisible hand, if you will, providing everything we need in order to please him. So when we doubt God's providence, we, that's, that's why we covet, and that's why we try to accumulate stuff. Why do we worry and fret about the daily issues of life? Why do we do that? Why are we not content with what we have and not... Um, let me back that up a bit. Why are we not content with what we have and not confident that if we really needed it, God would supply? Why is that? Why are we anxious even about the most basic issues of life, like what to eat and what to wear? Whether or not we articulate the reasons, we tend to live in that kind of world. All right, you got up this morning and you likely did these two things. Not necessarily the first things you did, but you likely did these two things. You likely walked into your kitchen and opened the refrigerator, which is full of stuff. Some, is, some of it is identifiable, some not so much. But you looked in there for several seconds, you didn't take anything out, you shut the door, and you said what? There's nothing to eat. You started to get ready for the day. You went to the closet, which is so full that your closet, your closet rod groans every time you open the door. So you open the closet door, you look for several seconds, and then you said what? I have nothing to wear. 
You were anxious because there was nothing for you to eat and nothing for you to wear. Granted, not everyone has the abundance of food and clothing, but all of us have been anxious for one reason or another about the basics of life. We've worried that, there, that we would not measure up to what everyone, what, the way everyone else is, and we've coveted what other people have. I don't even want to go to church today because I'm not going to look like I fit. I don't want to do that because I, 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 you know, we go on and on and on. Why do we do that? I would suggest that it has something to do with our theology. Jesus said, for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. And then he calls us to consider that, uh, so, so what's the problem in our theology? We doubt his providence. Jesus said, I want you to observe my providence. And so he starts giving information or illustrations of how he takes care of things. Let's start with his providential care in relation to ravens. He mentions these birds. You know what ravens are? They're scavengers. They are considered in the Old Testament law as unclean and as an abomination. <laughs> the word is used in the Bible. Leviticus 11, God listed these birds as among those that the Jews were to quote-unquote detest. In case they failed to get the message, he repeated, they are detestable. Okay? This included quote, every raven of every kind, all right? So if we didn't know that, in Leviticus 11, it makes us know that these are not exactly friendly, wonderful pet birds, okay? And yet, what does the Bible say about these birds? God feeds them. Then Jesus says, of how much more value are you than the birds? And by the way, that's not a question, that's an exclamation. Okay? Jesus wasn't asking them a rhetorical question. He's making a claim and he's emphasizing it of how much more value are you than these birds? Don't you get it, he's saying? Then he picks up in verse 27 with lilies. Verse 28, he lumps them in with grass, stuff that grows wild and sometimes is gathered up and burned as fuel. But those lilies are beautiful. He says. Now we'll get to that a little bit later this morning. The point he makes is that God clothes the lily of the field and he feeds the detestable birds of the air. Do you think he might be able to feed and clothe you too? Do you see God's providence in your life? When you start getting all anxious about these little things, do you realize that there is a God in heaven who's just taking care of you, moving things around, working things out? feeding you, providing for you, caring for you? If you don't, you will be anxious. Let's take a step, a, close, a closer uh, step here. How do we embrace the providence of God? How do we trust his providence? Look at the end of verse 28. How much more will he clothe you? And then Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. When I'm anxious about the issues of life, when I worry about things such as food and clothing, I'm exercising a flawed theology. I don't really trust the providence of God. I don't really believe that he will supply what I need. Instead of trusting him, I fret, I worry, I complain, I whine, I scheme, I covet, and I doubt. I don't really believe that God is who he says he is. So Jesus is given a lesson on the providence of God and he's calling his listeners to trust him. If we fail to recognize and embrace his providence, we will struggle with anxiety. All right, let's move. Are you ready for a second one? <laughs> All right, that's the first problem. We don't trust his providence. The second is we don't trust his sovereignty. That's verses 25 and 26. God's sovereignty, let's talk about that, and its ineffectiveness uh, and the ineffectiveness of worry. A sovereign God, you know that word, it's a, it's a big word, kind of a tough uh, idea in some ways, w the way it's applied often, but in essence it simply means God is in control. 
He controls everything. So we say that all the time. God is in control. God is in control. Something happens to somebody else, God is in control. Something happens to me, what in the world is going on? Okay, we, we had that problem, but God is in control. We say it, we believe it, sort of. When things are not in control, when things are out of control, wow, we worry, we fret, we panic, we beg, we plead, we cry. All kinds of things when we think things are out of control. But none of those responses help because the issue at hand is out of our control. Those responses of ours have no effect on what's happening or what has happened. So here's the theology. Things are not out of control. God, a sovereign God, is in control. Now, I could go around this congregation and point to dozens of you who've gone through horrific stuff, some of it not that long ago, okay? Um, all kinds of things that have happened in our lives, okay? Difficulties and problems. And, and sometimes it seems a little weird to say, um, hey, it's okay, God's in control. You know, well, yeah, thanks. You know, I mean, that doesn't sound like very compassionate. But actually, ultimately, God knows what he's doing. He's taking care of everything. And when I know that and understand that and embrace that, I cannot, I, I can, I cannot be overwhelmed by anxiety. The more we understand about God's sovereignty, the less we will worry. The more we accept the sovereignty of God in our situation... In our current condition, whether that's our health, our age, our, cons our, our circumstances, whatever it is, the less we will be anxious and the more we will trust him. Worry solves what? Nothing. It only adds to our anxiety. Trusting the sovereignty of God helps us relax. Let's talk about God's sovereignty and our finiteness. Jesus used the illustration. At first, it might surprise us. Verse 25. Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? I'm going to live just another minute. <clears throat> Can't do it. If, if then you are not able to do this small thing, Jesus says, why are you anxious about the rest? So what's Jesus saying? Perhaps, among other things, he's teaching us that God is infinite, and we are not. He is in total control of all things, and we are not. We can't even control the circumstances so as to extend our lives by one hour. The answer is not to worry about it. It's to rest in his sovereign power. When I'm resting, I'm not tossing and turning. I'm not full of anxiety. True, there are, there are things we can do, but a whole lot of life is outside of our control. And those are the things we worry about. Jesus, in effect, is saying, I've got this. Don't worry about it. Just trust me. Now, if I worry, I am anxious about many things. It's because I've failed to trust the sovereignty of God. Do you see why theology is important? If I don't know anything about that, I, I think, God, I don't, I don't know, you know, but no, God is sovereign. He's in control. And God is a God who has everything under, not only under his control, but he, he works providentially all those things out for his, for his own purposes, which amount to his glory, but also for my good. All right, let's go back to the lilies. Let's talk about God's generosity. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil, probably with, with people in mind and working hard, nor do they spin, probably thinking about spinning yarn, spinning wool, whatever. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today, and tomorrow was thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you little faith? So what is Jesus teaching us about God? He's talking about God's generosity. Now, we can see God's generosity in creation. Some of you post pictures on Facebook. You post pictures of clouds and sunsets and trees and lakes and rivers and flowers and rainbows. Why do you do that? 
You do it because those things are beautiful. And the closer you look at them, the longer you gaze, the more amazing it is. This bit of God's creative genius. Have you ever noticed in, in creation that God just does things to the overwhelming way? I mean, just beyond belief almost. You see some of the beauty of what he has made, and it's just like he goes to the extreme Every time you look at that, it's just a bit of God's creative genius. If you believe that God is the creator, as you see these things, you think, wow, God is amazing. Wildflowers don't last. They come up, they wither, they die. But God has painted each one of those flowers with lavish beauty. Solomon went all out on the temple. Read in the Old Testament as David was collecting all of these things for the temple. God didn't allow him to build it. And then Solomon becomes king and Solomon brings in the workers. He brings in all these people that did things with a very fine, uh, uh, fine artistry and gold and tapestry and all kinds of things. And by the time this thing is completed it was magnificent it was something to behold it had to be ranking up there as one of the seven wonders of the world you know it was just incredible in fact there was a queen of sheba the queen of the south makes this long trip to come and see solomon and she sees the beauty of the temple and she is awestruck what does god what what is what does jesus say about that flowers of the field they're a whole lot Incredible, more incredible than the Solomon's temple. Some people think God is stingy. They think he holds out on them. Nothing could be further from the truth. God is unbelievably generous. All that he does is to the extreme. He's, his generosity can be seen in all of his creative works, but it can also be seen in his gracious gifts. Let's talk about the generosity of God experienced by his people. Tell me about God's generosity toward you. Have you seen it? Has he done anything for you? Have you seen that? Do you really think that God would hold out on you? When I think things like that, I have a wrong theology about God. That, means, that needs to be corrected quickly because God is a generous God. God's generosity experienced by his people. Think about this. Think about Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to talk about this outside next week. But in, Gen in uh, Ephesians 1, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. I love those words. Chapter 2, of the book of Ephesians, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive with Christ by grace. Talk about divine generosity, riches of his grace, rich in mercy, lavished upon us, great love. Paul went to another extreme when he was writing to the Romans and he said in Romans chapter 8, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Talk about the lavishness of God, the generosity of God. God did not withhold his best and his greatest gift for a bunch of Detestable, undeserving, mortal enemies. Why would he withhold the little stuff from his redeemed children? If you're struggling with anxiety, if you find yourself coveting what other people have, and you're frustrated that you seem not to be able to have what others have, and you're not happy about that, you need a theology adjustment. We all could benefit with a long look at the lavish generosity of God. Let's check out one more attribute of God in this text, and that is God's goodness. And that's verses 29 to 32. God's goodness explained in what he knows. Seeking after the necessities of life and worrying about them is a universal problem. That's what Jesus said in verse 30. Listen to this. For all the nations of the world seek after these things. They all do. 
Th that's why we are so instinctively drawn to that. But our Father in Heaven knows. A good Father knows and cares about His children, right? What they eat, what they wear. Jesus is making the case that the Heavenly Father is a good Father. He knows and He cares. Jesus is making an ironclad case about the goodness of God. He's been laying down doctrine after doctrine about the God of the Bible. These things are all true about God. Why do we have such difficulty believing this about God? He knows the situations of our life. He knows each of us. He knows what we need and he knows when we need it. He knows how to meet those needs and he has all the resources necessary and available to do it. So let's check out the goodness of God as expressed in what he gives. Verse 32 is amazing. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Did you hear what Jesus just said? We want this, we want that, we covet this thing, we covet the other thing. He wants to give us the kingdom. We're ready to settle for way too little. When we're seeking the kingdom, that other stuff doesn't matter that much. God will give, God will give us what we need because he's providing, he is a providing, sovereign, gracious, good father. But he doesn't want us to settle for this stuff even if we could get it. Would we be satisfied? No. He doesn't want us to settle for the stuff when we can have the kingdom. I remember reading a story a number of years ago from uh, Howard Hendricks. Hendricks, now in heaven, he was a professor of Christian education at Dallas Theological Seminary. He talked about being a kid. He was, he was, uh, I, I, he grew up in the east, out east, and, and he, he was, uh, by his own, own humble admission, an exceptional checker player. There was this older fellow in the community who was purported to be the best. So one day in the park, things were a little slow, and the older fellow invited Hendricks to a game. It started out pretty good. The older guy moved, and Hendricks countered that. In fact, Hendricks started jumping the opponent's checkers like crazy. It seemed really easy. He's thinking, this guy is only purported to be the best because he's never played me. So he keeps going, and finally the older guy maneuvers one checker to the other side of the board, and he said two words, king me. And with that one king, he completely destroyed Hendrick's entire arsenal. Hendrick's lesson for the day was this. You don't mind losing a few checkers along the way if you're headed for king territory. That's what we have here. This passage makes sense when we embrace the right theology about God. This is who he is, and this is where we're headed. And we're going to get there, so there's no reason to worry. Now, how do we respond when we embrace this correct theology? That's verses 33 to 34. And they're rather shocking. So hang on. He tells them to sell what they have. Am I really supposed to do that? Am I supposed to sell everything I have? If so, how do I respond? Now, it's okay to have things. We all have things, and that's okay. But when things have us, it's a problem. It's time to get rid of them. If those things are causing my affection for the Lord to be divided, or my attention to the Lord to be distracted, or my investment in the kingdom to be diverted, it's time to sell that stuff and use what I get to get back on track. Remember, it's his good pleasure to give us what? The kingdom. So don't settle for stuff. If the stuff is in the way, get rid of it. And the second part of that goes along with this, give away what you have. Am I really supposed to do that? Well, if what I have can help somebody else, my desire to help should overcome my desire to have 
and hang on. What does it mean to provide myself with money bags that do not grow old? That's a kind of a strange statement, isn't it? I think it means something like this. Things that lay around just get old. We'll think about that a little bit. <laughs> um, things that lay around just get old. Things that are used don't usually get old, they just wear out. Our money bags ought to be continually emptied out for the sake of kingdom things. And as they are emptied of our stuff, they will be filled up with heavenly spiritual treasure. And guess what? Nobody can take that away from us. And that can never be destroyed. And then I think we are to live by the treasure principle. Am I really supposed to do that? And, and what does it mean and how does that look practically? Well, my treasure reveals my heart. If my treasure is in my investments, that's where my heart is. If my treasure is in the things of God, that's where my heart is. If my theology of God is correct and I live that out daily, being consistent with what I claim to believe, I will not only worry less, but I will more often worship. I will not often be anxious, but I will be awed by the Lord in all of his goodness and greatness. I will not often covet, but I will often seek to be generous as my heavenly Father has been to me. Theology matters. What you believe about God will affect how you behave before God. And so Paul wrote, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. That means you rest in his providence. You rest in his sovereignty. You rest in his generosity. You rest in his goodness. And when we do that, Here's what he says happens. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Anxiety, gone. Trust in him restored. That's what Jesus is saying. God help us to look to him to know him and not be anxious. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the incredible gifts of the Lord and the Lord Jesus and the gift from you, Lord, the Lord Jesus, your son, dear God, who paid for our sins. Father, you gave him to us that we might have eternal life. And all of our life, because of that, it rests in you, a God, a father who is good a father who is gracious, a father who is in control, a father who moves heaven and earth around in order to accomplish your purposes in your children. Amazing. Oh, we thank you for that. We struggle. We're like the disciples that heard this lesson from Jesus. Oh, you have little faith, which probably you meant to tell us, oh, you have no faith. Don't, just don't trust you. Please forgive us. Help us to trust you. Some are going through some real difficulties right this minute. Lord, I pray that you would overwhelm them with an understanding of who you are so that they might be overwhelmed with a confidence and joy and peace in you. Thank you that there is a peace that passes understanding. There is a rest that comes from you that nothing can take away. I pray for your grace as we go through difficult circumstances, but I pray for your help that we will not forget who you are. And I pray that knowing you will allow us to rest in you and to trust in you so that we're no longer doubting you or disbelieving you. Give us grace even now. Father, there may be some who are overwhelmed and anxious about the end of their life and about eternity. 
Thank you that you've given us the gospel, that if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we not only can be saved now for eternity, but we can know that. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. These are written that you may know that you have eternal life. Oh, dear God, may that be so. And may we live by that as we continue to understand what it means to receive from you the kingdom. In Jesus' name.